spooky friends. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Murder Murder News podcast, which also serves as a weekly meeting for our very own true crime cult. That's right. We started a cult. But not to worry, you've landed in the cult with all of the sing-alongs and none of the sarin gas. Grab a flower crown and take a seat around the fire as we dig into another tale of murder. In case you're just finding us now, allow us to introduce ourselves. I'm Angelina, and I'm here with my sinister sister, Aurora. How's your week going? Mm, It's going. Yeah, (laughs) moving along. It is cold. (laughs) And unpleasant. (laughs) Yeah. Heading straight for winter now. All joy is gone. (laughs) (laughs) All joy is draining from the world. That's where we're at right now. (laughs) But at least we have this podcast to keep us going. Yeah, true. Well, just because you tune into our show week after week, we do consider you all to be honorary monsters. But if you'd like to officially join the MMM commune, you can do so on Patreon. Just head over to patreon.com slash murder murder news and pledge just a few bucks a month to get unlimited access to our catalog of patron exclusive content plus we'll give you an official title like deacon or grandmaster of goats and we'll send you your very own adorable baby goat we just posted our halloween exclusive on patreon uh you can still tune in if you missed it to hear aurora and i tell our best spooky stories in an immersive campfire video we'll be right back after a quick commercial break for one of our fellow dark cast podcasts are you into the spooky and macabre Is your inner witch dying to learn more about what makes the world magical? Do you occasionally crave nerdy horror content from film and RPGs? Well, have we got a podcast just for you. Join the squad at Mission Spooky where Kiki, JC, and Cord research some of the scariest historical places from Pennsylvania. Listen to our ghost stories and legends. Learn as we delve into the world of history, magic, and folklore. And be entertained with our D&D 5e RPG segment, Cordverse Cryptid. Find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and follow us on Spotify, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And remember, stay spooky. And don't die. But if you do, contact us. And we're back. We just want to give a shout out to our amazing listeners who left us reviews on Apple Podcasts this week. We really appreciate the feedback. Jackie Moore said, These ladies know how to balance entertaining conversation with stories of victims. The stories are authentic, caring, victim-focused, and respectful, but Angelina and Aurora begin and end their show with personal stories that have nothing to do with crime. The stories are hard to hear, and I know they're hard to tell, but the banter at the beginning and the end allow listeners to binge the show. Great job, ladies. You make my work days a lot shorter. Thanks so much, Jackie. And thanks so much to Kiki0699, who said, I'm hooked after one listen. Angelina and Aurora do a great job at covering such sensitive topics with respect. Both of their voices work together really well and are easy to listen to. Overall, an amazing job in such a kind way. Before we dig in, we want to offer a quick disclaimer. Though we joke about forming a true crime cult, that is not to diminish the severity of actual cult activity, and we want you to know that we take the cases we're discussing very seriously. We want to deliver each story with the utmost respect to victims and anyone involved. If you feel we've missed the mark, you don't like our tone, or if you notice we've gotten any details wrong, let us know with a quick email to murdermurdernews at gmail.com and we'll make it right. Some specific trigger warnings for this episode include elder abuse, domestic violence, sexual abuse, and self-harm. If any of those are particularly sensitive subjects for you, you may want to skip this one and listen to one of our other episodes instead. 33 years ago this week, serial killer Gwendolyn Graham was found guilty of five murders committed alongside her girlfriend, Kathy Wood. The killer duo met while working at a nursing home in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and before long, the two had moved in together. Their volatile relationship escalated to drinking and fighting and led them to share their dark fantasies of killing someone together. They talked about targeting other employees of the nursing home before settling on much more vulnerable victims, the patients. No one at the home suspected the two women of their attacks, and they likely would have gotten away with it if it weren't for Kathy bragging about the murders. 
her eventual confession raised more questions than answers, as many began to wonder if the murders had even ever happened at all, or if Kathy was just a vengeful ex-girlfriend. Our sources for today include Forever in Five Days, the chilling true story of love, betrayal, and serial murder in Grand Rapids, Michigan by Lowell Caulfield, an episode of License to Kill, um, which I really recommend that show in general, actually. Mm. Um, I saw a few of their episodes. I actually watched one on accident thinking it was this episode. And it's actually um, hosted by Terry DeBrow, which anybody who watches Real Housewives of Orange County knows that he is Heather DeBrow's plastic surgeon husband. Uh, so there's like a, a true <laughs> interesting like a, a true crime housewives crossover there. <laughs> but also it does a really good job of telling victim stories. And they had a lot of the families there and spent a lot of mm-hmm. time uh, on that, which is of course something we really value. So definitely go check out that show if you're looking for something to watch. There's at least a couple seasons of it. Yeah, I remember watching one of those episodes for um, research when we were doing the Donald Harvey episode, the Angel oh, of Death thing. So yeah. that was uh, also good. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to go check that episode out then. It was really good. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, we also used an episode of the show, The Serial Killers, Wikipedia, and more. For a full list of our sources, check out our show notes. The concept of modern-day nursing homes didn't really exist in the U.S. until the creation of the Medicaid and Medicare programs in 1965. These programs allowed government funding to build facilities for aging populations, whereas most facilities before this time were run as asylums. By the mid-1970s, the industry exploded as the number of nursing homes in the U.S. grew by 140 percent. Fraud and abuse almost immediately ran rampant in nursing homes as there was initially little regulation and many homes were known as, quote, park and die facilities. Public outcry led to new legislation. In 1974, regulations for skilled nursing facilities were put into effect, setting standards for staffing levels, staff qualifications, fire safety, and delivery of services in order to be certified by Medicaid and or Medicare. By the 1980s, nursing homes and assisted living facilities really boomed. Some theorized that the recession of the early 80s pushed real estate investors to look into non-residential projects. And with government funding keeping facilities afloat, nursing homes seemed like a good investment. In 1985, the family of Marguerite Chambers was desperate to find a good nursing home. Marguerite had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 1974 at the age of 48, but had shown signs since she was 46. Today, Marguerite would have been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Early onset Alzheimer's is much less common, affecting only 5 to 10% of all Alzheimer's cases. Anyone diagnosed with Alzheimer's before the age of 65 is considered to have early onset, which can often be more aggressive. We highly recommend the book Still Alice by Lisa Genova for a beautiful and sad look into the disease, specifically early onset, um, which unfortunately is what my uncle passed away from at a young age. It's really so aggressive. And I think it just feels so much more sad because it happens at such a young age, especially if it starts when somebody's in their 40s. Like it just seems so unfair. It's yeah. terrible. Yeah. Marguerite was born Marguerite DeBoer in Walker, Michigan on November 8th, 1926. She spent most of her life in the same farmhouse where her grandmother had been raised many years earlier. When Marguerite first married her husband, Ed Chambers, the two lived at the same farm and the same house, but eventually built their own home and sold some of the land. Marguerite and Ed had four children together, Carol, Jan, Gary, and Edward Jr. Marguerite was known for being kind and hardworking. Family was so important to her. According to her daughter, Jan, quote, she loved life. She loved doing things at the spur of the moment. She loved to dance and her and my dad, they would always go out dancing, you know, a couple times a month. She worked at Lear Siegler for 30 years, calibrating flight instruments. She had led 4-H groups and was really active in general. She loved to water ski and just about every type of dance, especially the polka and waltz. Ed loved to tease her about her Dutch heritage and would often comment on her strong Hollander blood. Jan, her daughter, married her first husband in 1972, 
and she remembers arriving at the reception dinner and realizing the plates and napkins were missing. Marguerite was supposed to bring them, but forgot. She rushed home to get them so they could all enjoy dinner together, but once home, she forgot why she had gone home in the first place. Her family didn't think much of it at the time, but then Marguerite started to forget what she was doing at work at Lear Siegler. Others started to notice. It was affecting her job performance. Marguerite had been a dedicated employee at Lear Siegler for 30 years, so they really wanted to find a way to make it work. They talked to Ed and put her on sick leave until they could figure out what was going on. Her family took her to the Mayo Clinic for testing, and at the age of just 48, Marguerite was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Being diagnosed at such a young age meant Marguerite still had kids at home in school. The disease progressed quickly. Her family watched as she seemingly aged in reverse, wearing loud clothes and becoming pouty and almost teenage-like. She started parking in the middle of the street to go shopping, and Ed had to take her car keys away from her. Her vocabulary began to decline, making it impossible for her to play her favorite game, Scrabble. In less than 10 years, her speech suffered as she went from speaking in fragmented sentences to using only one syllable and eventually becoming nonverbal. Ed retired early from his job and stayed home to take care of Marguerite full time. He had to feed her and help her use the restroom. Her last summer at home, she loved wandering around the family farm. She would look at the plants in the greenhouse while Ed sat on the porch watching her explore. As Marguerite continued to decline, it became harder for Ed to care for her. Marguerite would scream at times as though she was hurt or scared. Ed couldn't find anything wrong, but the neighbors called the police a few times. She was placed on a sedative for the screaming, but the medicine made it so she couldn't walk. Ed attempted to carry Marguerite around the house, to the bathroom, to feed her, but it became too much for him to handle alone. Ed couldn't afford an in-house nurse for her care, so he and the family looked for a long-term solution. They brought her to a state-run psychiatric unit, but Marguerite bounced from hospital to hospital as there was a two-year wait for nursing homes around Grand Rapids, Michigan at the time. The conditions in the hospital were dismal, and her family was getting more and more desperate to find a cozy place where Marguerite could get the 24-7 care she needed. When Jan would visit her mom, she would hear patients screaming, and some were locked into what appeared to be giant cribs. Luck was on their side when there was an opening at Alpine Manor, or so they thought. Ed's eye doctor had taken pity on their plight and helped get Marguerite into the nursing home right away, and it was just three blocks away from Ed and Marguerite's home. Jen knew some of the nurses' aides, and the staff was so reassuring. The facility was clean and homey with curtains, carpet, and artwork. Unlike some of the psychiatric units, the patients at Alpine Manor seemed to be friendly and chatty. There was ice cream every Thursday, movies on Fridays, bingo on Saturdays, and church on Sundays. There were crayons and finger paints and construction paper for crafts. Marguerite was moved into her new home in July of 1985. She had visits from her family every day, often several in the same day. Even during the worst part of her disease, Marguerite still recognized her family. When Ed would come to visit, she would shake her hand until Ed would sit next to her and grab it. She would instantly calm down. Marguerite lived at Alpine Manor for the next two years, seemingly without a hitch. The home always communicated well with her family and listened to any concerns they had. Then, on Christmas of 1986, Jan went to visit her mom with her four kids and husband. While there, Jan noticed her mom had a little food on her face from dinner. She went to get a wet washcloth to clean it up, then sat in the bed next to Marguerite, telling her she was going to wipe her face. Marguerite began flailing her arms and twisting her head away. Her eyes grew large with fear, and she started shaking. She was terrified. Something seemed wrong. Jan talked to the staff, but they assured her that paranoia and fear were symptoms of Alzheimer's. They assured her that they would do a better job of keeping Marguerite clean in the future. January 18, 1987, started off like any other day for Marguerite and her family. Ed went to visit his wife. An activity staffer had come to visit with a tape player. She knew Marguerite loved waltzes, and her favorite was the Blue Danube waltz. 
The staffer played some of Marguerite's favorite music for her while Ed reflected on their times dancing together. That night, an aide doing her regular evening rounds found Marguerite dead in her bed. The home called Jan's house around 8 p.m. and her husband answered. They told him, we're sorry to inform you that Mrs. Chambers passed away tonight. Her husband asked how, and they told him they believed she had choked on her food. This didn't make sense to Jan since her mom had to be fed, which means someone should have been there with her while she was eating. Marguerite was given a Catholic funeral the following Tuesday and Wednesday and was buried at Rosedale Memorial Park. Her cause of death was determined to be from heart disease, and Jan soothed herself by thinking the nurse who called must have been confused when she said Marguerite had choked. Myrtle Luce was born in Michigan on February 10, 1891. She married Mace Luce in 1906, and they were two peas in a pod for their entire 65 years of marriage. They had two kids, Ted and Hazel, and the family had always been close. As a young woman, Myrtle worked as a sales clerk, but eventually turned her attention to taking care of those around her. She once took in a troubled teenage boy. She took care of two of her husband's sick sisters and two sick aunts. Ted thought his mom's health started to decline when his dad died in 1971. Before his dad died, he told Ted, don't you put your mother in a nursing home. You have to promise me that. Ted never intended to see that happen to his mom, but Myrtle needed more consistent care, and Ted was 65 himself. Hazel visited her mom at Alpine Manor every day, sometimes twice. At the age of 77, the daily visits were getting harder for Hazel as well. She had recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's herself. At the age of 95, Myrtle had spent a couple years at Alpine Manor and had been known for being good-natured. She wasn't able to walk or talk after a series of strokes. She was never diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but Ted believes that's probably what she had. Yet she had recently been told by a doctor that she had a strong heart and was healthy as a horse. That's pretty amazing at 95. Incredible. Yeah. Around 2.30 a.m. on February 10th, 1987, an aide found Myrtle laying unresponsive in her bed just 10 days before her 96th birthday. She was laying on her back with her arms by her side. Her family was called shortly after. They were told that she had died in her sleep and it was likely a heart attack. Her family knew she had been in declining health and said they were expecting the call. Yet for some reason, Ted's wife had this feeling Myrtle had choked. With her heart so strong, it seemed unlikely that she would have died of a heart attack. Myrtle was cremated and her ashes were buried in Memorial Gardens. May Mason, also known as Maisie, was born on February 2nd, 1908 in Dayton, Ohio. Her granddaughter has mentioned that she doesn't believe May graduated from high school, but she was smart as a whip. She met her husband while working at a counter at Macy's. The two married and eventually moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan. They had a very comfortable life together with her husband managing two department stores. Their daughter, Linda, went to school at Michigan State and their son went to law school. After her husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's and after breaking his hip, May found it too difficult to take care of him herself and found a nursing home for him in 1963. He passed away at the nursing home in 1965, and Maya always felt guilty for allowing him to go to a nursing facility. She had always been lively and vibrant. Linda, her daughter, could recall how her mom would make her homemade dresses as a kid. She had a knack for it. She wouldn't use a pattern and would stay up all night making something just lovely. She had a love of the arts and always took the kids to the opera and theater. After Linda had kids, May took her grandkids to see plays and operas as well. May practically lived at the theater. She had a big love of gardening and her house was filled with plants. She could often be spotted outside tending to her yard and garden. When May turned 65, she decided she was bored and reinvented herself. It's never too late to reinvent yourself. She got into interior design and would set up rooms for Ethan Allen. At the age of 69, May got a new boyfriend, Jerry. The two of them would go out dancing every Friday night come hell, high water, or snowstorm. 
may even once rode a snowmobile out in her evening dress because she wasn't about to miss her night out dancing. She was so likable, Linda's husband, John, even loved his mother-in-law. He has said that he knows it's weird, but she was his best friend. Linda's two daughters, Stephanie and Sari, adored May, referring to her as Nana. Stephanie's parents worked a lot when she was a kid, so she was largely raised by her Nana. May would take Stephanie to the Grand Rapids Civic Theater, where she worked managing the candy counter or as an usher. Over time, May's memory started to fade. One time, Stephanie came home from school and found her Nana drying her underwear in the oven. May had lost track of time and almost burned down the house. This worried Stephanie, and she talked her mom into getting help for her Nana. May was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. For a while, Jerry tried to help, but May wasn't sleeping and was pacing all night. The family got her a trained German shepherd to help keep her from straying too far from home, but the police were called a couple times because she made it miles away on foot. They decided the best move for May was a nursing home where she could get the help and support she needed, but this is a decision Stephanie has always regretted. Like Marguerite, May jumped around from hospitals to nursing homes. Once, Linda went to check on her mom in a home and found her bound and drugged by the staff. When the family found Alpine Manor, it felt like a better, safer choice. Stephanie has said, quote, we would have literally been better off keeping Nana in a place that would let her walk out into traffic than the hellhole that wound up being Alpine Manor. On February 2nd, 1987, Linda and Stephanie went to visit May for her birthday. Maisie was an avid walker and loved doing laps around the halls, but she had recently broken her hip and needed help getting around. Linda and Stephanie each took an arm and the three walked down to a day room in the home. As many who have a loved one with Alzheimer's know, you have good days and bad days. And on this day, Stephanie really felt like her Nana remembered her. It was a good day. Two weeks later, on February 16th, a nurse's aide checked on May around 2 a.m. May's diaper had leaked and the aide had to clean her using a wet washcloth. This seemed to agitate May. She kept grabbing the towel. The aide helped her get comfortable again and left her to fall asleep. The aide went back to May's room at 4 a.m. This time, something seemed wrong. May appeared gray. She tried to wake her up, but she was unresponsive. She checked her pulse, but couldn't find a beat. Alpine called May's family at 6 a.m. to let her know May had died peacefully in her sleep. Stephanie remembers being confused by this. May had recently been to the doctor, and he had said May was physically healthy. She had always been active, and the only issue she had was Alzheimer's. Her mother comforted her by saying she didn't have Alzheimer's in heaven and was Maisie Mason again. They were at peace knowing her suffering was over. May was cremated, and her ashes were buried next to her husband's at Graceland Memorial Park. Belle Burkhard was born Belle Mary Martin on March 25, 1912, to her parents, John and Mary, near Mackinac Straits in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and was three quarters Ojibwe. She came from a big family with 10 siblings. She lived in a rural home that overlooked Silver Lake. And after moving south to St. Joseph in 1935, she dreamed of moving back north. In St. Joseph, Belle worked as a cook and married Ernest Doro. They had a daughter, Nancy, together, but Ernest passed away in 1961. Belle was twice a widow by the age of 56. Nancy had four kids, and Belle helped her raise them. After her second husband passed, Belle lived alone in an apartment in Grand Rapids until 1979. Her brother worried that Belle was no longer able to take care of herself as she was having issues with her teeth and keeping clean. At the age of 67, Belle was struggling to get around and used a cane. She was once found wandering around Grand Rapids, unable to remember where she lived. She had been diagnosed with hardening of the arteries, arthritis, and organic brain syndrome, or OBS. Her family believed her OBS had stemmed from drinking because Belle really liked to drink beer, and her and her husband had drank heavily when Nancy was a kid. Belle had long stints of sobriety, 
but it seemed as though her periods of harder drinking had potentially affected her memory. It's possible she could have actually had Alzheimer's or some type of traumatic brain injury, but Bell didn't have the financial resources to undergo testing. Bell was a longtime resident at Alpine Manor and notes from her early days at the home said she was communicative, cooperative, and friendly, and was only forgetful at times. Not long after she arrived at the facility, it appeared she was not settling in well and began trying to escape. She would be found wandering around the parking lot and making use of the emergency exits. The staff started restraining her to her chair at meals and as she slept to keep her from walking off. The restraints, for obvious reasons, really pissed Belle off. She started to become more hostile and started swearing at the staff like a sailor. She didn't make friends at the home and often wanted to be alone. She would swat at the aides with her cane. Belle was a little ornery and was also known to sneak into other patients' rooms to steal their candy and sweets. Can you blame a girl for having a sweet tooth? (laughs) While staying at Alpine Manor, they were able to get to the bottom of Belle's troubles with walking. One of her legs was longer than the other. They created a lift for her shoe, which really helped with her mobility. She was able to do laps around the home, but after a nurse feared she was walking too much and exhausting herself, they started restraining and drugging her to keep her more sedentary. This sounds awful, and it's no wonder why Belle was showing signs of aggression and wanted to be alone. Belle did make friends with one of the aides at the home. Gwen Graham had just moved to Grand Rapids from Texas, and Belle loved teasing and getting teased by Gwen. In December of 1986, Belle's daughter received a phone call from Alpine Manor at 4.30 in the morning. The young caller told Nancy that Belle was not doing well and wasn't expected to make it through the day. Nancy drove the three hours to Grand Rapids to see her mom, expecting it to be their last day together. When she arrived, Belle wasn't in her room. Had she been too late? A staff member directed her to the dining room where Belle was eating her dinner, looking quite healthy. Nancy sat and fed her mom dinner, but it didn't seem as though Belle recognized her. When Nancy went to the nurse's desk to investigate the phone call, she was told there were no notes about Belle's declining health and there shouldn't have been a phone call. On February 28, 1987, an aide stopped by Belle's room at 4 a.m., She'd stop by her room at 12 and 2 to turn her and stop to turn her once again. She was found dead in her bed at the age of 74. Belle was cremated with her ashes buried in Gross Cap Cemetery in Mackinac County. Edith Cook was born in Sandusky, Ohio on November 28, 1889. She was one of three kids and her father worked at a furniture store in the city. Edith went to school for millinery to make hats and worked for a while at Foster Stevens in the silver department. In 1913, she married George Cook. They adopted a baby, but the child died at 14 months old. The two started a restaurant together in 1939, but in 1940, George died as well. Edith ran the restaurant by herself for a while, but ended up selling it a couple years after George passed. Edith never had any more children, and when she was 92 years old, she decided it was time to check herself into a nursing home. Prior to that, her brother Frank would often stop and check on her, but without any other family, she liked the idea of having someone else clean and make meals for her. Edith was an absolute hit at Alpine Manor. She was one of the most popular residents there from the time she arrived in 1981. She loved bingo and nursery rhymes, and she would often sing one, two, three, grandma caught a flea, flea died, grandma cried, one, two, three, to the aides. She loved walking around the home, stopping to talk to nurses and other residents, and never missed any of the activities. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1985, but didn't feel like it was worth it to have surgery. The cancer didn't spread. In March of 1987, Edith ended up getting gangrene from sores on her feet. The pain became unbearable and she was treated with pain meds. She had a hard time sleeping and eating. Her weight dropped. On April 5th, Edith managed to sit up in her wheelchair for a visit from her nephew's family. At 12 a.m. on April 7th, an LPN checked on Edith. She was in bed spelling words. The nurse applied some ointment to her sores. 
at 2.30 a.m., an aide reported to the LPN that she believed Edith was dead. She was laying on her back with her arms by her side. Administrators had not suspected a thing. Neither had the families of Marguerite, Myrtle, May, Belle, or Edith. The women ranging in age from 60 to 95 all had reasonably serious ailments, and there was no reason to perform autopsies on the seniors believed to have passed from natural causes. Then, on October 6, 1988, a man named Ken Wood showed up at a police station in Wyoming, Michigan, to report a series of murders. Ken Wood had been married to an aide working at Alpine Manor, 26-year-old Kathy Wood. According to Ken's testimony, quote, she told me that starting in February of 1987, that she and her girlfriend, Gwen Graham, had murdered or suffocated a woman. I believe her name was Margaret Mead. I know for sure it was Margaret, or I'm pretty sure it was Margaret. And that between February and April of 1987, that they had suffocated six different patients at Alpine Manor. Ken went on to tell Detective more about his ex-wife. The two had been separated for a couple of years. She had started dating another aide at Alpine Manor, Gwen, but the relationship had been pretty toxic, according to Kathy. In early August of 1987, Kathy called Ken. The two had stayed in touch, and he felt like Kathy would sometimes use him when she needed help with bills and such. She called him that night, concerned. Kathy and Gwen had broken up, but Gwen wanted to move back in with her. Kathy told Ken she was afraid to get back together because they had done things she was ashamed of. Ken pressed her for more details. She said they had stolen a lawnmower and some eggs. Ken felt like there was more to it and again pressed her for more info. She made him promise not to tell anyone. He promised. She asked him what was the worst thing he could think of to do. Ken said, quote, murdering someone, Kathy, murder. That's the worst. Kathy replied, well, Ken, try six times. Kathy didn't want to give Ken any more details over the phone, so she went over to his house. She told him that Gwen had used washcloths to smother Marguerite, who Ken recalled as Margaret. She said Gwen put one washcloth under her chin and rolled another one up, placing it over her nose. Kathy had stood watch at the door. She went on to tell him how they picked patients. They picked patients that wouldn't be a threat in case they survived. Patients that were nonverbal or very vulnerable. Their first plan was to use the initials of the patients to spell murder. They started with Marguerite, an M name, but this method proved to be too difficult. She mentioned that Edith had been a mercy killing because she was in pain from the gangrene. Trying to rationalize his ex-wife's actions, Ken told himself these were in fact mercy killings. Kathy had always had mental illness, and this wasn't exactly rational behavior, but he believed she could get help and wouldn't be a danger to others. From the sounds of it, Gwen was the ringleader, and without Gwen in the picture, Kathy wouldn't kill on her own. He essentially told her what he was thinking and that she had been messed up in her life and she could get help. She responded, no, Ken, that's not right. We did it because it was fun. Over the next year, Ken kept a secret to himself. He thought about it often and he had pushed Kathy to get help. He remembered hearing about serial killer Donald Harvey, whom we discussed in episode 74, a nurse from Ohio who killed between 37 to 57 victims. According to Donald, he would build up tension in his body, so he had to kill people. Similarly, Kathy said Gwen killed people to relieve stress. It's unclear why Ken didn't go to the police sooner and what prompted him to finally come forward when he did. Ken told police that he didn't believe Kathy was a threat to anyone because she had broken up with Gwen and Gwen had moved back to Texas. He turned her in because she had pissed him off on a Valentine's Day getaway to Vegas the previous February. Officers weren't sure what to make of this. Was Ken just a vengeful ex-husband? Had he made this up? Could anyone really be monstrous enough to kill six elderly women in such a vulnerable state? How could they even prove these murders had taken place? The detective believed Ken was being truthful and decided to do more digging. 
The detective went to Alpine Manor to talk to Kathy. He asked her to come to the station with him, and she calmly got her coat. Initially, Kathy denied that a murder had taken place, and she said Ken just wanted to get back at her. Then she claimed it had been a joke. Then she said she had walked in on Gwen holding the washcloth over Marguerite's chin and nose. She had done this once and found out a few hours later that Marguerite was still breathing. A few days later, she went back. Kathy said Marguerite struggled as her body spasmed and she made grunting noises. She said Gwen thought it was funny, so she kept going. She listed Marguerite, May, Belle, and Edith. She said she believed there were more, and when an officer handed her a list of deceased patients, she remembered Myrtle had been a victim. It's unclear if there had been a sixth victim or if Ken had remembered this information incorrectly. When the detective pressed her for details, she evaded his questions. He told her that if he went to talk to Gwen, there was a good chance she would say it was Kathy who had smothered the woman, and that it was in her best interest to be the first to talk. Kathy said Gwen had threatened to shoot her if she told anyone. She said Gwen had also tied her to their bed and threatened to smother her to death once as well. Kathy went on to describe trophies they had taken from the victims, things like jewelry or a sock. Detectives found Kathy's confession to be meandering and dishonest. They still didn't know if a crime had even taken place. Kathy was born on March 7th, 1962 in Soap Lake, Washington on an army base. She moved to Massachusetts as a kid as her dad was shipped off to the Vietnam War. She had a younger sister, Barb, and the two were close. Kathy felt like she helped raise her sister. She was quiet and shy and Barb described her as a bookworm. When her father returned home from Vietnam, his personality had changed. He was emotionally and mentally abusive. Kathy was tall at just under six feet, and her father made fun of her weight and her height. He made her feel ugly. She talked about her first sexual encounter being with a trans man named David. Some have speculated that she made up the story to hide the fact that she was a lesbian, but being transgender was not something people felt safe to share in the 70s and still very unsafe now. Yeah. So it's certainly possible David hadn't shared that information with her at the time, um, but she had gone to David's house and the parents said that's our daughter, Deborah. So it sounds like they might have just been unaccepting of her actual gender identity. Nonetheless, her family shamed her for intimacy with David. And when she was a teenager, she met her future husband, Ken. They were married when she was 16 or 17. She was pregnant her senior year of high school, but being a mother didn't seem to interest her. In fact, she even said she couldn't stand kids and had a tendency to be a child abuser. So it's probably best she just left. Kathy was unhappy in her marriage. She wasn't attracted to Ken and she wanted to get out. When the two separated, she didn't have a means for income. She saw an ad for nurses' aides at Alpine Manor and applied for the job. She had volunteered as a candy striper in high school, and the facility was close to home. It was at Alpine Manor that she met Gwen Graham. Grand Rapids had a bustling LGBTQIA population considering its size. The nursing home happened to be a queer-friendly environment, and one straight man journalist gleefully said, quote, One nurse's aide told me Alpine Manor had become a covey of lesbians. Gwen was born in Santa Monica, California on August 6, 1963. She moved around between Indiana and California as a kid before settling into Tyler, Texas when she was nine. She traveled to Africa as a teen as a missionary. When her parents divorced when she was 17, She went to live with her dad in Modesto, but dropped out of high school to travel the West Coast before returning to Texas when she was 21. She had a troubled past with her father sexually abusing her. She started self-harming as a means of not only coping, but to get back at her father by making herself less attractive. She would cut and burn her skin with cigarettes. Gwen had started dating her girlfriend, Fran, when she moved back to Tyler, Texas in 1984, but after Fran moved to Grand Rapids, Gwen followed. Her plan was to go to school to become a paramedic, and she found a job at Alpine Manor in the meantime. Kathy and Gwen met one day in the break room at Alpine Manor. 
Kathy was sitting in the break room with her friend Dawn and Gwen walked in. The two became friends and then decided to move in together to save money. According to Kathy, that lasted about five minutes and the two were intimate almost immediately. Their relationship was volatile with lots of jealousy fueled by binge drinking. Gwen was very possessive of Kathy. The two would go out drinking at Carousel, a local gay bar, and ultimately end up stirring up drama. One time, a woman was flirting with Kathy. Gwen got so enraged that she beat up the woman. Once, Kathy recalled a time where Gwen dragged her by the hair back to the bedroom. Both women tell a story about the other one tying them up and inserting a gun into their vagina and threatening to shoot them. It's unclear who threatened who. Their toxic relationship started to deteriorate as Gwen started having an affair with another aide, Heather Barriger. The two were on again, off again, until Gwen finally quit Alpine Manor and moved back to Tyler, Texas with Heather. After Kathy's initial confession, detectives headed to Tyler to talk to Gwen. Gwen denied that any murders had taken place and said Kathy was just lying to get back at her for moving on with Heather. Gwen took a polygraph test and the results were inconclusive. Heather ended up showing up at the police station and detectives described their unusual relationship. Heather had laid her head in Gwen's lap the whole time as Gwen told her, don't worry, my little puppy. With no evidence and only Kathy's very vague confession, detectives were told to close the case. It looked like Kathy was lying and unstable and there just wasn't enough to go on. The officer got Kathy to agree to a polygraph test and she failed. It looked like she was lying. He told her that unless she could testify to taking part in the murders, the case would have to be closed. Kathy then admitted to keeping watch as Gwen murdered each of the women and gave more details as to why they had done it. According to Kathy's confession, the murders had bound them together. It started as a theoretical scenario during sex. The two would talk about what it would be like to kill someone. They talked about killing other members of the staff at Alpine Manor. They finally decided to go after more vulnerable patients. They had first discussed using the initials of the patients to spell out M-U-R-D-E-R, but when that proved to be too challenging, they had another idea. Committing murders together would bond them together. According to Kathy, quote, it might have been me that said that. If we did this, then we would never be separated from each other. She liked that because we'd have something on each other forever and it was something that would bind us together forever. Oh God, that's silly, but that's what it was. They started telling each other that with each murder they committed, it would bind them together, not only forever, but forever in a day. They added a day on for each murder they committed. Kathy wrote the following poem for Gwen. I want to get married right now, right away. Don't make me wait till the day. When you're mine, oh, please say you'll be mine forever and five days. Kathy's new confession was enough to keep the case open, and now detectives search for evidence to bring it to trial. They tried to exhume the bodies of the five women, but the issue was that three of the five victims had been cremated. Marguerite and Edith had been buried, so on December 2nd, 1988, officers went to talk to Jan, the daughter of Marguerite. They told her Kathy had confessed to the murder of her mother. Jan's response was, even after death, she still has to go through being tortured. The medical examiner could not find clear evidence as to whether she had died of natural disease or suffocation, but given Kathy's confession, he felt he had enough evidence to rule her death as homicide. On December 4th and 5th, Kathy and Gwen were arrested and charged with five counts of murder. Kathy was offered a plea deal if she agreed to testify against Gwen. Kathy was sentenced to at least 20, but not more than 40 years in prison for her role in the murders of Marguerite, Myrtle, May, Belle, and Edith. She was charged with one count of second-degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit second-degree murder. She was released from prison on January 16, 2020, and is living with relatives in South Carolina. Stephanie, May's granddaughter, testified at Kathy's parole hearings, having to face her grandmother's killer. She said, quote, 
I thought I was going to start screaming in the middle of the courtroom. These people that we loved, my Nana, they weren't even human to them. At Gwen's trial, prosecutors were concerned. They had so little evidence against Gwen, and it was pretty much Kathy's word against hers. Gwen held to the idea that no murders had taken place. The women all died of natural causes. Kathy was just a woman scorned. But then Heather, Gwen's now ex-girlfriend, testified against her. She said Gwen had confided in her about the deaths and told the same story as Kathy. On November 3rd, 1989, Gwen was found guilty of five counts of murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder, and the court gave her five life sentences. Learning that these women's deaths took a toll on their family members, but seeing Kathy out on parole has been a nightmare for them as they continuously feel unsafe and like others could be at risk as well. Jan has since said, quote, my mother suffered towards the end of her life. These women did way more damage than they realize, not only to the people they killed, but their families. That's one thing that a lot of people who um, target vulnerable people like that or people that they can easily cover up their tracks with um, don't consider is like their families um, right. are obviously going to be traumatized by the situation if it comes to light or maybe even if not, you know, there'll be some confusion, you know, like it, it's not just concerning the one person that they murder. Everyone's got a network. So. Yeah. But, you know, obviously the murder on its own is bad enough, but it's uh, so many uh, so-called angels of death and they don't think about who they're impacting. They really don't. And, you know, like these families were really dedicated to their moms and their grandmas. Um, like pretty much all of them had visitors every day. And like in the case of Marguerite, her husband came to visit her every single day. He never missed a day. And yeah. it's just... Yeah, you'd think you'd notice <laughs> something like that as a, a nurse's right. aide. Right. And like how they like picked these particular women. Like it's just, it's so messed up. So yeah, sad. Really disturbing. So what are you watching this week? Anything? Uh, the only thing I've watched is the second season. I'm actually not finished with it. I think I have one episode left and I cannot wait. Uh, but One of Us is Lying. Oh, never heard of it. Oh, it's really good. It's on Peacock. And it's kind of like, I know what you did last summer, kind of a thing meets Pretty Little Liars. Like this, there's sort of like this like omniscient like person who like sees all their actions and is sending them texts and like, Hey, I know what you did, like kind of thing. And, um, it's a little like cheesy high school kind of thing, but I don't know. I think it's good. Like I definitely get really engaged and can't stop yeah. myself from watching it, but I like hokey things. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's great. And I did like they just revealed who one of the people is and I would not have guessed it. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and are you watching anything? Um, uh, not really. <laughs> I uh, I did watch a, another horror movie, I guess, um, which was the latest installment of uh, Paranormal Activity, Ooh. which was the next of kin. There's another one coming out soon uh, ish. I've read, so that's cool. I've read. I've watched this one just in time, I guess. Is that but, good? Uh, it was. Um, it was fine. It was like. I I mean I think in general they're good. I like their vibe. Like I feel like I can sit and watch almost any paranormal activity movie oh. of which there are very many, <laughs> but like, uh, I've enjoyed most of them, but this one was just like, um, had like spooky Amish secrets. Mm. <laughs> so that was, uh, different I like the of that. <laughs> kind of culty. Yeah. So I've never seen cool. a paranormal activity. Oh, you have to at least watch the first like one or two. Okay. They're, they're pretty good. I'll that to they're my scary list. without like any gore. So oh, it's I like good. that. Okay. I'll put that on my list for this weekend. Cool. Well, I guess that's enough murder for one week. If you need just a smidge more murder, you can always find us on the OG murdermurder.news for the latest breaking true crime news all week long. You can also find us on Instagram at Murder Murder News, on Twitter at mm, Murder News, on TikTok at Murder Murder News, and on Oh, mm. <laughs> Delay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and on Facebook by searching for Murder Murder News. And when you search Murder Murder News on Facebook, you'll also see our group pop up. 
You want to hit that join button to stay in the loop about any upcoming events we may have and to join our virtual book club. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if you're enjoying the show. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to make sure you never miss an episode. And we really do appreciate those reviews. And you will get a shout out from us on the show if you leave us one. So leave one so we can (laughs) celebrate you. Yeah, we love it. Please. (laughs) All right. Have a great weekend. Bye, friends. Bye.